Well, it's early April here, and Josh and Collins and I are out doing a little walking, and uh, it's actually turned out for me anyways to be a pretty good shed season. Found some, some good match sets, some deer I'm looking forward to finding back later this summer, but probably my favorite find is this six point side here. And uh, it's from a deer that I filmed back in January this year. And what makes it so cool is Collins and I both have history with this deer and we really don't hunt the same area. So like I said, the backstory, I filmed him January 5th of this year, out, out just filming late season. He came out and I immediately recognized him as a deer that I filmed uh, the previous late season. And, uh, you know, thought it was pretty cool. I hadn't seen him in a while. That's about all I thought of. And uh, until I got home that night, I uh, got to my computer and from producing the Heartland show, which is the, the show that Collins is on, I still had the still image on my background from the previous week's show. And the cover photo was of this, a, a buck that looked like this is what I originally thought. And uh, thought, no, that's kind of funny. And I, I jokingly text Josh and Collins like, these bucks are twins. You know, the, the buck I filmed tonight, this buck's twin. <clears throat> well, then I pulled up the actual episode and, and watched Collins hunt. And at that point I realized it's the exact same deer. So immediately got on Google Earth and if the deer walked a straight line from the food plot we're standing in right now, which is where Collins encountered him, to where I filmed him on January 5th, sometime over a 10 to 12 day period, he would have walked 8.41 miles at the minimum if he walked a straight line. So, you know, I told Collins, this is the same deer, and you didn't believe me, did no, you? No, I thought, I mean, that was crazy. He had to cross a river, I mean, 8.4 miles. There's so much ag and timber on the way there. Yeah, and a, a mild winter where there's food ever. You have exactly. a ton of food had, on this one. We farm. had corn down here. We had tons of turnips just and beans, just what you had. Yeah, I mean, and so there's no reason. Here. So it, it's so crazy to think about that. So then we started doing some digging, and like I said, I had recognized him from the previous year, so I sent Collins a picture of what he looked like and sure enough, yeah, you had I'd pictures of him, right? Pictures of him right in his food plot, actually. Yeah. And, and that what was that mid October? Mid October, around the fifteenth, I think. Yeah, yeah. So he's obviously made that eight, nine, ten mile trek multiple times over multiple years, and it's just it's fascinating to me. I, I want to know the reason why, and um, you know why he'd make that trek when, especially you know, sometimes you assume it's due to food or sh some other reason, but this was after all the shotgun seasons, mild winter, food everywhere, so. Just really cool. It's cool to pick up his shed here a few weeks back too. And uh, you know, just such cool history and, and to have that documented on video and trail cam is pretty unique. So it's gonna be fun to try to find oh, him yeah. back. And it's gonna be interesting. I mean, he showed up here this year, mid-October as well. So. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see which one of us gets the, <laughs> yeah. gets the hunting this year. We'll see, it'll be interesting. Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Fuse Accessories, Realtree, Muddy Outdoors, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Easton Arrows, RTP Outdoors, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Ozonics, Wilderness Athlete, Grizzly Coolers, Redneck Hunting Blinds, and Nikon. Other than finding sheds, the other thing I really love about this time of year, you know, March, April time frame is usually when I when we get all the aging results back from all the deer we harvested the past fall. Um, it's cool to get those back from the company and you know find out whether you're right on with the ages or if you're off a year by two, whatever it may be, but it's cool to get that confirmation. So we sent a bunch of teeth in. There's actually a ton of deer killed uh, on on the main farm that I hunt. Um, I sent in the teeth of the buck I killed on November 21st. He came back at five and a half, which, you know, no surprise. I didn't have history with the deer, but the consensus, consensus from all the neighbors I talked to was that that was the deer's age, five and a half. So, no surprise there. I also sent in the teeth from George Brett, the the deer I found from shed season a year ago. And uh, he came back at five and a half as well, which is again, exactly what I thought. I had hunted him as a four and a half year old and thought about passing him because I thought he was four. Um, and then five, I h tried hunting him and just never had any encounters and found him dead that, that following shed season. So cool to know that he was confirmed at five and a half. Uh, some of the other bucks we sent in 
Uh, Hermit was actually killed this past fall by another hunter. We sent his teeth in. He came back at five and a half. Again, exactly what I thought. I had passed him as a four and a half year old for that reason, uh, but good to get confirmation. Uh, another deer I hunted that was killed by a hunter, a deer I call Scratch, same exact situation. He, I passed him as a four and a half year old, hoping to hunt him as a five year old, and he came back as, at five as well. So no surprises with any of those, but good to get confirmation. The one deer I was wrong about uh, is a deer I call Curly. It was killed by a bow hunter early in the season. I thought he was also five and a half, and he came back at six and a half. He's a deer I had about, I think, three years of history with, and I thought he was a three-year-old on my first encounter with him. Passed out as a three-year-old, that's what I thought it was a three-year-old. Thought I passed him as a four-year-old and then he killed as a five-year-old, but really he was actually four the first time I saw him, and five last year, and then six this, this past fall. So, um, you know, whether you're right or wrong on those ages, it's, it's always just cool to get confirmation. and. You know, when you are wrong, you can look back and learn and kind of look and you just get better and better at it all the time. It's getting getting close to that time, chase some turkeys and, and uh, start working on food plots and start creating that inventory for this coming fall. Thanks for watching Midwest Whitetail. Welcome to this week's show. I'm shooting a new release today. A friend of mine named Gary Keaton invented this release uh oh he's been working on it for a couple of years and it's finally on the market spot hog is uh manufacturing and selling this release and we're going to be uh working with this release and shooting it and testing it and uh proving its usefulness here at midwest whitetail over the coming year in this following segment randy Ulmer, one of the best archers and one of the best bow hunters that we've ever had uh, is going to talk about the spot hog keaton release in the various ways that you can shoot it. Hi, my name is Randy Ulmer. An old hunting buddy of mine named Gary Keaton uh, designed a new release aid and he asked me to tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's called the Keaton Release Aid and it's made by Spot Hog. Now, the thing that, make this, that makes this release aid so unique is that it combines all the positive things, all the positive attributes of a T-handle or handheld style release aid with all the positive attributes of a, a, an index finger or a wrist strap release aid. There are three things that this release aid does that most release aids can't do. One is it allows you to pull more weight, very important for young or, or female shooters. It also allows you to hold back for a longer period of time, which is important for all of us bow hunters. But the most important thing, in my opinion, that this release aid does is it allows you to use the same release aid with the same impact point it allows you to shoot it several different ways and all, again all of those ways will have the same impact point it allows you to shoot it like an index finger release aid but get a little bit extra power or you can shoot it purely as a T-handle style release aid, which is one of my favorite ways because it seems to be much more accurate for me, more like a target release. And I shoot it with my middle finger, which is very important because it keeps all the forces in alignment. The other way that I like to do it is to uh, use it as a back tension style release aid. And the way I do that is I'll get it back here and I'll keep my fingers engaged in the T-handle portion of the release and squeeze with my back. Okay, the way I like to load the release is I engage the trigger with my middle finger behind, my index finger ahead, and then when I put the hook onto my D-loop, I push forward with both my index finger and my middle finger and it engages with 100% surety. The bottom line is this is probably the most unique release aid on the market today. And even if you're as strong as a bull, even if you can pull back as much weight as you need to pull back or hold it as long as you want, uh, there are reasons to try this release aid. Um, it's just a whole package of release aids meshed into one. Uh, one of the things this allows you to do is if you've always shot an index finger style release aid, but you've toyed with the idea of improving your accuracy by going more to a target style T-handle release aid or handheld release aid. What this is going to do is it's going to allow you to experiment 
while still having the safety net of going back to your index finger whenever you want. So if, if a buck's coming through thick brush, you've got a small window to shoot, you can just revert back to your normal shooting style and get that arrow gone quickly. The other thing is if you've got shoulder problems, if you're older, if you've had some, some serious shoulder problems or arm problems, it's gonna allow you to pull more weight. Or if, if you're a woman or if your girlfriend has a hard time pulling back the amount of weight that is necessary to be legal in your state, this might just get her to the point where she can pull that much weight back. You really need to try this release. There's a lot of things I don't have time to talk about. You're going to learn about them as you shoot this release aid, and I think you're going to be really impressed. It's April 19th. Zach and I are out doing a little bit of mushroom hunting today on Bill's farm. There's two things to love about springtime and that's turkey hunting and mushroom hunting. And I was able to get out for Iowa's first season turkey and shot my bird the first day. So now we're gonna go out and try and find some mushrooms to make a good meal with those breasts. And we just got here to Bill's farm, walked down to the woods and we got one right here, but we're gonna do a little bit of walking, give you guys some tips for mushroom hunting uh, hopefully we'll find a pile of them down here. This is just a little side hill that goes down into a bottom. It's been really wet here in the Midwest this year. And the reason we're out right now is we had a rain last night. It's been sunny all morning. It's pretty humid and that's the first, first recipe for mushrooms is to get that soil temperature up around 55, 60 degrees to get those mushrooms popping. So we're gonna grab this big guy here and uh, we just started off on a good note. Hopefully we can find a few more. We just found a little wad of mushrooms here. I marked a couple of them with uh, my water bottle and bag to wait for Zach to get down and pick them. But uh, that's the first tip that we're gonna give you is if you find one, usually there's gonna be more. And another great thing to have is a walking stick or like what I got right here is just a tiny little stick. Um, once you find one, you don't wanna start stomping around because a lot of times these mushrooms can hide under this vegetation. So what I like to do is kind of circle around immediate area and there's a there's a decent little wad of them right here and I came around grabbed the stick and you just kind of start pulling back in front of you before you start stepping and that's how I found that guy right there if I would have just started walking I probably would have stepped on that and there's one right there too that I wanted to see without this stick so you definitely don't want to just stomp around once you find one um, but I'd say there's at least six or seven right in this general area and we haven't really started looking too too hard so Let's pull a couple of these and uh, keep looking. But definitely if you have a walking stick or once you get out in the woods, just grab yourself a sturdy enough stick to pull the brush around and it'll definitely help you find more. That's a fresh one. One there. Sure, there's more around here. Well, we just got to uh, the next spot where we found some mushrooms. And as of right now, we've only found three, but they've all been right next to this dead maple tree. It's still got a little life in it, but a lot of these dead limbs have fallen off. And these morels will like to grow around these dead trees. And that's kind of been where we've been finding a lot, or all of them today is around these really big maples. 
but a few other trees that you can look for and that you'll you know sometimes find morels around are dead apple trees dead elm trees a lot of people will find them around dead elms uh, dead ash trees definitely check in on those dead trees it'll make you more effective and like today like i said we've been finding them around these big maple trees so that's what we're going to keep looking we haven't really found any in other areas so there's a bunch of dead trees right around here we're going to kind of zip through this maybe with a little more looking we'll be able to pick up a few more we're up to 17 mushrooms right now so got ourselves a little bit of a side dish anyway hopefully we can find a few more Zach and I are wrapping up our uh, mushroom hunt for this afternoon. We ended up finding 21 mushrooms, so that's not too bad for a quick little walk in one area. But uh, what's interesting about all these is we found 99% of, of them around those maple trees. Um, the weather is looking pretty good the rest of the day today uh, with that rain that came through and the humidity. I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of these are gonna start popping a lot more. So we may even try and get out again tomorrow afternoon and uh, see if we can pick up a few more. But uh, a couple of tips that we went over is focusing on those dead trees. Make sure to have a walking stick or find a stick in the woods. And once you find one mushroom, don't start trampling around. Use that stick to kind of fiddle around through that area, pull the brush back, and uh, usually you'll find a couple more. Overall, we're not experts at mushroom hunting at all. These are just a couple of tips that we have figured out throughout the last couple of years doing it. And I think we're still pretty early in the season, so. There's uh, definitely a lot more mushrooms to pick. The weather's been beautiful, so with a little more humidity today into through the night and uh, those soil temperatures still climbing to get to that perfect number, uh, I think we'll be finding some more morels here in the next couple days. Well, that's it for today's episode. I appreciate you joining me. We're gonna fry up some mushrooms now and. Jim Reiser stopped by and killed a turkey, so I think we're gonna throw them both on the Traeger grill and a couple hours we'll be eating turkey breast and, and morel mushrooms. I keep saying this every week, but we are getting into the food plot season here. So we'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.